everybody. Welcome to the Philly Sports Convo. I'm Jason Lee. This is episode 15, and I'm really excited about my guest today. Uh, you talk about a legend in sports and broadcasting. And before we get to him, uh, just a reminder. First of all, thank you, everybody who's been watching and listening the past 14 podcasts. They've been so much fun. Uh, and if you want to support the podcast, there's really a cool way you can do that on phillysportsconvo.com. We have a great shop on the site right now. Uh, you can get... Uh, Shirts with the with the the convo logo. You get sweatshirts, t-shirts, knit caps, uh, sweatpants, all sorts of accessories too. Coffee mugs, tumblers. Uh, what else do we have? Mouse pads, desk pads. Yeah, the whole the whole nine yards. It's all there. So my my guest for episode fifteen, and I've been lucky enough to talk to this guy a couple of times on TV. I'm glad to have him here in the podcast space because in TV you only have like five or six minutes, but here doing a podcast, we get all the time in the world. And there's so much to talk to, so much to talk about with Chris Wheeler, the legendary former Phillies broadcaster. Wheels, always good to see you, man. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Jason. I'm glad we could work it out and uh, find the time to do it. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's, it's always fun to talk to you. And, you know, you, you're you such a wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm when it comes to Phillies baseball. And we were just talking off the air, uh, you know, before we started this, before we started recording. This Phillies team... What was the word you used? Was it ridiculous? Was it crazy? What, I forget what you said. <laughs> it, 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 is, uh, it is kind of amazing to watch because I've seen so many teams. And this one is one of those teams that's fun to watch, I think, because, uh, well, now they have 26 players on a roster. And they all seem to contribute. Uh, when, one, when one doesn't do something, somebody else does. So it's just... <laughs> Look, for them to be 21, 22, whatever games over 500 they're going to be uh, when we do this, I, I, it's just remarkable to me because they have, they've they gotten off to such slow starts the last few years. And the Braves have to be sitting around thinking like the Phillies were the last few years. Don't these guys ever lose? Really? That's true. That's true. And actually, I, I do want to make this caveat before we continue the conversation. We're recording this on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, what is today's date? The 20, 22nd? Right? 22nd, yeah. 22nd, Wednesday the 22nd. So anyway, so that that's out there. But, you know, a, a prime example of what you're talking about, Wheels, is you figure Trey Turner's been out for a little while now. He, he's he been having a, a hell of a season so far, and they haven't missed a beat without him in the lineup. Yeah, remarkable. Because uh, when he went down a couple of weeks ago, I thought, oh, here's the first one. Here's the first, first hitch that they're going to have. And, uh, you know, and he was so hot at the time and he's right at the top of the lineup and he does so many things with his speed and he was playing pretty well at shortstop this year. So yeah. How are they going to cover for him? Well, they've done more than that. You know, Sosa's done a tremendous job when he's in there, they'll move Stott over to play shortstop and put somebody else to play second base. You know, they had Clements come in there and do some things and play well there and Merrifield and those kind of guys. So Look, if you're going to have a good team, I always tell people, they say in spring training, they ask me, how are you going to be? I say, well, let me know who the 40, 45 players you're going to have by the end of the season <laughs> do, uh, and then we'll have an idea. Because it just never the same guys that start the season are around the whole year, and True. so many guys have to be around to have a have a good year. And that's what I remember from a lot of our good seasons over the years. That there are a lot of people contributed. Oh, no doubt about that. Um is is Bryce Harper in all your time watching and you know being involved in Phillies baseball is Bryce Harper the best free agent signing ever I mean it's it's him or Tome I guess neck and neck but uh, give me your thoughts on Harper and just how, how big he's been well he's so good yeah you know I was like you know I was still broadcast you know are many guys around that are playing now that are that I saw play in person as a <laughs> broadcaster and of course I saw him come up when I guess he was 19 or 20 when he came up with Washington. Yeah. And he was just out of control in those days. You know, he was running into walls, diving and hurting himself. The high school mentality that he had coming up, which is a good way to do it. You can hustle, but you don't have to do the crazy things that he was doing. I remember kept saying he's going to get hurt if he doesn't watch himself. Right. But the one thing you notice right away was unbelievable bat speed. You don't teach bat speed. And it was there. The ball just jumped off his bat. He was a plus outfielder at that time with a plus arm. He could run. He was a plus runner. Everything about him. So, yeah, that was a great signing by uh, by the Phillies at the time. Uh, you know, went back and forth between him and Machado, and they obviously got 
fortunate that Machado went to San Diego yep. and that Harper decided to come to Philadelphia because this guy is really, really good. And you can tell the other players feed off him. You have that one big superstar in the middle of your order like that. It relaxes a lot of other people. Well, you know, and, and he leads by example, too. And, you know, you, you, you look at how quickly he came back from, from the, the elbow surgery, and then he, he takes it upon himself to learn a new position. And, and, and he really dedicated himself to learning first base, and he's become a pretty good first baseman. Yeah, and plus he goes and helps kid kid get a date for a <laughs> That's right. Prom. <laughs> the Talk proposal. About somebody that gets it. That, he gets it. That's, he, he totally gets the Philadelphia market. Yep. Jason, he does. Well, you, and you, um, you know what's amazing, Wheels? I mean, here's a guy who's making, and, and we know what kind of crazy money that there is in sports. He's making, what, $26 million a year, yet he, he's relatable to the average Joe making 40 or 50 k. You know, And that's not easy, but but he is. He's relatable, as, especially to the, the, to the blue-collar mentality of Philadelphia. Yeah, I'll get back to that in just a second. But the thing, oh, I'm sorry, you're cutting out on me a little bit. I, the... Um, I'll get back to that in just a second because that's a great point. But you you mentioned about his play at first base. I think right now he's a Gold Glove first baseman. He made an error. I would agree. Error the other he made. I think it was his first one, and that was because he had a little bit of a brain cramp. You know, when you're you're a first baseman, you have to communicate with your second baseman all the time and make sure you know that ball's hitting the hole if he's there, or if he isn't, or how far you should go or not go. And then he got into a situation. I think it was Nola gave him a bad player but you watch him you know he's always had great hands yeah he could always throw uh even now that he had the elbow thing and he and bobby dickerson worked so hard i would watch them on the half field in the morning sometimes and he worked so hard on showing him where to position when balls are hit in certain areas and everything you know every player has a place to go and the ball's hit and he didn't know where to go and now you you watch him he knows where to be for cutoffs he knows where exactly where to throw or when to cut one off or or not to so yeah and talking about the market he get uh look i'm not putting down any of the other guys i was around because everybody's different but i can't picture other teams that i was around with their star players going over the xfinity center after a playoff game <laughs> and hanging out with the fans i mean you kid yeah that 80 team that 93 team no way they had done anything <laughs> maybe 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 Rollins is, you know, Jimmy's team and Ryan and some of those yeah, guys. Yeah, maybe, not, maybe. But some of those other teams, come on. But these guys really understand what this town is all about, how emotional it is. And if you give them something back, then they're going to go out of their way to give you a little bit of leeway. And when things don't go right all the time, they'll have a less of a tendency to jump you. Uh, and I think that they have a great feel for that. Oh. No, no doubt, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Um, uh, but I want, I want to switch over to the pitching because first of all, I got to tell you, I don't like that they're calling Zach Wheeler wheels. Okay, <laughs> because there, there's only one wheels, and it's you. Okay, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm sure you don't mind sharing that nickname. No. Yeah, all right. I mean, is, is he the best pitcher in baseball? He's. I'll tell you a story about him. It's two when he first got here. A couple years ago, what was it, four years ago now? I, I mean, I don't know these guys. I don't get to talk to them. And then COVID and all that. So anyway, I went up to him four years ago, and I introduced myself. And I said, Is your, do they call you Wheels? And uh, he said, yeah. And I said, well, look, if you hear people yelling Wheels, it's not for you. So he <laughs> laughed. That, that told me a lot about him. Well, this spring training, first time I'd seen him since. He's standing outside the calf field, and I'm walking into the ballpark, and he's standing there. I will over to him and I said, I don't know whether you remember me or not, but I'm Chris Wheeler. I'm the other wheels. He said, I know you. He said, I've heard a lot about you. He said, it's really good to see you. That's so awesome. He's, he's that guy. He's everything that people say about him. He's a good guy. That's, I, is he the, well, if he isn't, he top five. Yeah, you know, I mean, who, who would you rather? I'm sure other people would say other people, but in a playoff or a World Series game, he's been dominant in those games. Um, this year, to me, he seems like he's having command problems early in games but he's you know he's got such good stuff and he's probably throwing too many pitches early in games and he's out of there a little earlier and maybe that can be a blessing in disguise as the season goes along sure uh, you know but, he's, but i've never this rotation for the way the games play nowadays jason is very unusual that they go six and seven innings deep so many times yeah really and, and you talk about 
you know, forget about a one-two punch. How about a one-two-three punch with with uh, Wheeler, Nola, and how about Ranger Suarez? How amazing's oh. he been? He, he's really good. He makes me laugh because I know how hard it is to do what he does. But you watch the hitters' faces. You know, they 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 they. You know, they start to kind of lean out a little bit, or they try to look for something because he's so good with his command. And the next thing you knew, he zips one on the inside corner, and they're gone, and they're looking up in the sky like, "You got to be kidding me." You know, how can he do that? How can he dot it the way that he does? So he has something going where it'll continue. Uh, he's an unbelievable fielder of his position. Yeah. So when they hit balls back at him, and he doesn't look like he has a heartbeat when he's out there, never changes his expression. He looks like he's just having a good time. And uh, from what I hear about him, that's, you know, he's not pitching. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's just unbelievable what he's been doing so far this season. Uh, so as we record this, they're what, 21 games above 500. Can they sustain this? I mean, because you no. know, you know better than than anybody. The, you know the ebbs and flows of a baseball season. There's gonna be there's gonna be a, a six or seven game losing streak at some point this season, right? I mean, they they can't sustain this all year long, right? You always go a week when you don't win. You know, it just happens. Yeah. Right now the parade's on. You know, when they lose four or five in a row, the parade will be off. You know how we are <laughs> in Philadelphia. <laughs> you know, yeah. Of course, you can't you can't keep up this pace that they're on right now. But what they've done is. You know, everybody said, well, they didn't play anybody. Well, they played who they were supposed to play, and they were front-loaded with home games this year, and they're good at home. All that's true. But that doesn't mean they were going to build up this lead that they've been able to build up right now. So what they've done is they've cut themselves some slack for the obvious problems that are going to come during the season yeah. because the ebb and flow of a baseball season, though we haven't been involved in it so long, it just gets draining at times with the the trap and all the things that you go through and that the players go through. So yeah, they're going to have some bad stretches, but they keep winning games like this and they get this far over 500. They can have some problems and withstand it. Yeah. You know, and, and actually you said something, it, bu it bugs the hell out of me hearing people say, well, they haven't played anybody. Cause like you said, you can only play with who's on your schedule. And it's not like, you, you remember last season when the Eagles were just squeaking by like the New England Patriots and they were just squeaking by the really bad teams and everybody's like, well, hey, look, they're finding ways to win. The Phillies aren't just squeaking by the bad teams. They're crushing the bad teams. So you, you can say, yeah, they haven't played anybody, but they're not just winning. They're dominating. And there's a lot. I mean, you you got to give them credit for that. Absolutely. I mean, they face the challenges that they've had to face. And, and as you said, Jason, they've beaten the heck out of some teams, too. You know, the teams at the end, they've won some close games. They've come from behind. They've gotten through some adversities. Um, look, it's going to get a lot tougher. You're going to play a lot more difficult teams. You're going to be on, this season. They're going to be on the road a lot at the end of the season. Whereas I said earlier, the last two years, it's really helped them because they needed to win so many games to get it into postseason, And they played so many home games at the end of the year. Yeah. That's not going to be the case this year, but to their credit, they're winning a lot of these home games. And look, the fans, that place, that place is a great place to play. Oh, it rocks. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it it's a home field advantage. And usually don't say that in baseball, but with those sellouts and the enthusiasm, it's intimidating to play it in that ballpark, even during the regular season, let alone during red October, which people enjoy so much. So how much, I, how much of this season do you think is they have this big chip on their shoulder after the way last season ended? I mean, we all remember game six and game seven at CBP against the diamondbacks and the offense just kind of went stagnant. How much of that is in the the back of their minds? Um, and do you, how much of that do you think kind of fueled the start this season? Well, I think I saw it starting spring training because I saw an inordinate amount of players taking third, call third strikes in spring training games. But then you realize what was going on was they were in this process of trying to realize how not to chase and to look for pitches in areas uh -huh, and in okay. spots. And I really noticed that there were a lot of called third strikes. Interesting. So they worked on that this year. You know, they talked about it. Uh, I'm not privy to being down there anymore. I've gotten to know Rob Thompson a little bit, which is neat because I get to talk to him once in a while. And he's even better a guy than you think he is. Yeah. But he said how they were working on those kind of things this year. And then they, they were preaching that to them and they were doing everything they could to quote unquote, get off to a better start. That was in spring training. 
And that was his hope. He, you know, who knows? But they did. Look, they were exposed by Arizona. Arizona threw them a lot of fastballs in those first two games. And, and you know, I think their pitchers got and players got tired of watching them fly out of the ballpark. And on that flight back to Arizona, whenever they did on the off day, they just decided, look, we're not going to throw them strikes. And we'll see if they chase. And if they do, okay. If they don't, then we're going to have to throw them strikes. To the credit of the Arizona Diamondbacks, they figured it out and the yeah. Phillies didn't. And to lose both those games at home last year, I didn't think that was possible. Neither did I. Yeah. Well, I, I remember um, after winning the first two games at home, there were a lot of people, including some people on the Phillies, which I'm sure they regret saying this, but some people on the Phillies who were kind of alluding to the fact that the series may not even go back to Philadelphia. That's how dominant you know the, the first two games were, but it just goes to show you, I mean, baseball's a funny game. It's dangerous to talk like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Been around way too long, and I, when I heard some of that, I went, uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, it's not good. I, I'm so specifically. You're to and... Yeah, you're you're right. Like when Garrett Stubbs said they were going to swim in, in the pool in uh, at Chase Field after they eliminated the Diamondbacks. You, you can't do that stuff. Well, he's kind of a happy-go-lucky guy, evidently, and that's his personality. But yeah, you're right. When I, that he was the guy, the first guy when I heard him say that, I thought, look, you don't want to do that yeah. stuff because those other guys are major league baseball uh, players for a reason. Yeah. And they knock the Dodgers out. That's, so if they knock the Dodgers good point. out, yeah. they've got some magic themselves. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's a very good point. So um, knowing what we know about the team, knowing what we know about the start they're, that they're getting off to, um, and obviously a lot can happen between now and October, early November. Uh, is it World Series or bust? I mean, is, is this a failure if they don't at least get to the World Series? I hate to call it a failure, but I think they say that themselves, that they feel like... Uh, that's their goal right now. Their goal is to get to the World Series where they haven't accomplished anything this year. And, you know, there's a lot. Look, it's not like it used to be. There's so many through now. Teams have to fight like heck to sometimes to just get a spot the way the Phillies did two years ago and especially, yeah. and especially two years ago and even last year. And the other team sits around and waits. You can get a little bit stale, too. So there's so many fakes. That's true. Uses I play one series and go to the World Series. Well, I understand why there's so many levels of playoffs now. It's for interest. You want to keep people involved in different cities in the month of September and, yeah. and August. But boy, that's yes. They, I think, and I I don't know because like I said, I, I have to always qualify by saying I'm not around them. I used to be inside the clubhouse. I used to be with them all the time. I knew what they were thinking. I knew what they were like. I knew who was a good guy and who was a jerk. I don't know any of that stuff anymore, except from what I hear from people around the club. But they are a good bunch. They enjoy each other. They compete. Uh, they care about each other. And they feel that they have to win a World Series. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So uh, let me ask you this, because you, you alluded to the fact that, you know, you're not around the team as much as, as we all know you used to be. Um, I, how, how do I want to put this? So I know you're doing the spring training games, right? You're doing the PA announcing for the spring training games. Are you doing anything? Are you doing anything else for the team these days? No. Okay. No. I um, I'm uh, I'm living in I'm in Florida. Uh, in fact, that's where I'm speaking to you now from uh, from my place in Bel Air, uh, which is Clearwater, basically. Mm. Uh, down here six months of the year. I just got back from a a wonderful two week trip that. I was able uh, on a World War II band of brothers uh, trip through Europe uh, off that wonderful HBO series from back in 20, 2001, I guess it was. Um, so, no, I, I, I enjoy my time with them in spring training. I, I, I enjoy doing the PA because it keeps me involved. I can still watch the games. And, sure. and I, you know, I, I analyze the games still when I watch it. I can't help myself because that's what, but I got to be honest with you. When that bus leaves, when those buses are lined up, six buses, we used to have two, I think, or three. <laughs> six buses lined up that day at spring training. I'd gone out to do something with my car and I was walking down the driveway and I was going to the Tiki bar to meet some friends out there in left field. Yeah. Uh, I was smelling exhaust from those buses and i was good with it <laughs> well listen i i will tell you and i think i speak for a lot of people and i'm sure you've probably heard this a million times but i miss you doing the broadcast i mean you 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 brought something to the broadcast you you, you brought a certain knowledge 
uh, you brought a certain expertise, even though you did, even though you didn't play the game professionally, you you had the knowledge of 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 a of a you know an ex player color analyst. And I always admired the fact that you were able to move seamlessly from color commentary to play by play, and sometimes in the same game. And that couldn't have been easy. You know, I, I admire versatility in broadcasting. I always have, and and I, I think that versatility is amazing. Was that difficult, especially having to do it in the same game? The most difficult thing for me was when I first started, and I didn't have any credibility with some people, and even some of the players who were my friends, uh, because I didn't play "quote unquote" professionally. Right. I played a lot of baseball. I sure. played up to American Legion, and I played a long enough. Uh, and how hard the game is, and I never, ever, ever went on the air and didn't act like that's the hardest game in the world to play. You had to be critical sometimes, but I always tried to do it with class and with knowledge um, because I understood the game itself and what it was like to play it and the fans that I was talking to. Uh, I learned a lot. I was young when I started. I was 26 years old, 25, 26, and I was lucky enough to have a lot of those guys be my friends. We were around the same age in those days. Uh, you mentioned Bo, you know, Bull. Oh, was there at that time who we became very, very close and continued that friendship up until as uh, unfortunately we lost him last year. Yeah. Um, Vuk, uh, Steve Carlton and I were very good friends, even though people thought he didn't talk, talk a lot. Uh, and these guys would take you under their wing and we would go out at nights and we would talk the game. And they told me uh, from day one that we like you around because you ask questions. You don't act like you know everything. Right foundation when I was lucky enough to get on the air and I understood the game. I had played it. I knew what a failure sport it was. I understood the market, uh, but that doesn't mean it was going to work. And it worked for some people. It didn't work for others. It bothered me for a long time and people that didn't like me. And then after a while, I really didn't care. And nor, nor should you, because listen, yeah. you can't, number one, you can't satisfy everybody, but number two, uh, you know, I don't care how good someone may think they are on the air, how long someone's been on the air, everybody gets some hate, especially these days in the age of, you know, Twitter muscles on social, or X, whatever they're calling that site these days, on social media, <laughs> everybody gets hate. I mean, even a guy like Vin Scully would have gotten hate today on social media. <laughs> and, and, and that should tell you something. I was so lucky to get away, get out uh, when that stuff was starting up. <laughs> you know, my, my, uh, my experiences were if somebody didn't like you, they'd write you a letter. Yeah. You know, now they sit in their ba mother's basement and type something, you know, and, <laughs> and I, I, uh, I just, um, I fought that at the end. I, I don't know that that was one of the reasons why Comcast didn't want me around anymore, but I, I wasn't going to tweet. And I told him that, you know, I told the Phillies that I told Dave Montgomery, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to get a Facebook page. And I'm not sense that goes on during the game and broadcasters read it and it upsets them while it's going on. Right. So I admit it. I, you know, I fought it uh, and it didn't help me. It didn't help my longevity, I don't think. But, you know, I was true to my principles and, uh, you know, they didn't want me anymore. Uh, it, it hurt my feelings at first. For the first years, I think I couldn't believe they could play without me. And, you know, it's been eight or nine, 10, almost 11 years now since I've been on the air. And I'm really good about it now. When, when Back in the bad days there after I left, when somebody would text me, uh, that do you believe what's going on? I say, I don't know. I'm on the third hole of Blue Belt Country Club, so don't bother me. <laughs> you know, and that, that, that's when I realized that I had uh, I, I'd moved on. Well, you know what? You, you, you get to a point, Wheels, where, um, and, and every broadcaster's been there because every broadcaster has gone through some sort of a, a setback like that. You get to a point where, especially as you get older, you look back and it's like, you know what? I've done a lot of cool things. I'm 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 very secure. I'm very proud of what I've done, and if you don't want me there, fine. I, you know, I'm happy with what I've done in in my life and in my career. And you should certainly be happy because it's, it was an, it, an an amazing career in the booth. Well, thanks, Jason. And you know, one of the greatest things about it is is when younger people like you come up to me or other or I'll, I'll meet fans now and they come up and tell me what a big part of their li their life I was. You know, it's part of their childhood and, and that I taught them the game and that they learn things from me and that they watch from. Th it's so flattering when, they, you know, I kid around. I say, where were you when I needed you? But, <laughs> you know, I, it, it, it is. Do, do you know why I'm It was like everybody else. I let some of the I let some of those jackasses on those talk shows get to me. Right. And things like that for a while. And then I realized 
you know, that's what they do. You know, that's the, whether they feel that way or not, that's the way it's going to help them. And if they do feel that way, fine, you know, come sit and try and do what I'm doing right now. I can't do it and I can't do what they were doing. So I learned to, I learned to just roll with the punches finally. And I was very content and, uh, and good with myself the last, I would say 15, 20 years that I was on. And now it's really flattering when people come up to me and tell me that I was part of the soundtrack of their life. That was a great DJ in uh, Philadelphia who was before your time named High Lit. Who oh, was, I, I know. I, 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 he used to use the line. I remember High Lit. You know High? Well, I, I never great met the guy. man, but like, I know of him. I got to know him, and he was a big fan of mine, which was really flattering because I was a big fan of his. Yeah. And he, his, uh, he used to play uh, the quote-unquote oldies, as they called them, and he said, I'm playing the soundtrack of your life. Yeah. So when people tell me, and use that term or something similar to that term that I was part of the soundtrack of their life. What what more can they say to me that, that makes me feel so good? No, that's, that's awesome. And very well deserved, by the way. Actually, it was just a Heilitz birthday the other day. I, I don't know how I don't know how old he would have been, but uh, you know, I certainly remember him from Oldies ninety eight and I know I've heard stories back in the day on Wibbage, uh, you know, the huge audience that he commanded, which yeah. Nobody in radio these days has even a fraction of that audience that High Lit had back in the day. But talking about your time in the booth, I want to bring up a picture. Uh, so, Wheels, can you see that? <laughs> and, and, and apologies yeah. to the folks listening to this podcast and not watching it, but it's a picture of uh, the broadcast team in the 80s. It's Wheels and Andy Musser and Harry Callis and Richie Ashburn. Uh, just do me a favor and talk about what those guys meant to you and, and how you all got along and how much fun you guys had, especially, you know, doing games together back then. Well, just looking at that picture, it brings a lot of emotions, you know, they, they were my friends, uh, uh, you know, and, and now, them now that they're gone, they've been gone for a while too, you know, to just look at that again. We had so much fun. We laughed. We were we had fun on the road together. We just had fun in the booth together. Uh, I had known Andy Musser uh, way before that when I was a kid working at WCAU in the 60s, and he was a sports director there. So he and I knew each other a little bit. But Whitey was my boyhood idol. He never, never, ever let me forget that I told him that. <laughs> uh, and Harry, of course, was one of the greatest of all time. You know, he had... Harry Callis had a, had a, an amazing pace to the occasion. Uh, when you know he could just go along, go along, go along, and boom! When something would happen, he got it and he nailed it. Yeah, and he was very, very, very good at that. So, uh, I, look, I was so proud to be the fourth member of that group. You know, when they said Harry, Whitey, Andy, and Wheels, you know, I, and to be able to, to, you know, I work with a lot of other guys after that, but that group right there was my first experience Phillies and we were together a long time the four of us uh and we had a great time we, we I have so many great memories from that and so many good feelings from that uh it, it, I get a little emotional right now talking about it after seeing that picture yeah there there, there was, it was well listen from from a viewing standpoint it, it was great um there was a book uh I want to say about 15 20 years ago by Kurt Smith called Voices of the Game I don't know if you ever read the book uh, if you haven't I will lend you my copy but he made a point in there uh, talking about the four of you together and he said the Phillies packaged baseball probably better than any other team did in the 1980s because of the four of you. Well, look, Kurt Smith was, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to meet him and obviously he sat and talked with him about his book and all that and about broadcasting and about our broadcast team and all that. And he, he was a good guy. I mean, I, I, he, he didn't act like he knew everything. You know, he asked questions and that uh, you know ask questions i always told kids that when i went out to speak you know right. ask questions you know do those kind of things um so when he when he talked about our broadcast team like that that was look this guy had a feel for broadcasting and a feel for broadcast teams and he when did. he thought that highly of our group um i can't speak for the other three guys but i i was very flat and i'll tell you what um what i loved about the two play-by-play -play guys in that picture that we just showed, Harry Callis and Andy Musser. First of all, Harry, okay, and and I grew up, I grew up a in in Philadelphia in the Philadelphia area anyway, Bucks County, and, and never left. So I've been a Phillies fan my whole life. Grew up, uh, you know, watching you guys, idolizing Harry Callis. And what I love about Harry, I mean, there there are certain announcers, and you even hear this today, that they have like some kind of signature phrase. 
but they have to force <laughs> it into everything. You know what I mean? Harry, of course, had his signature out of here, but what, what was his most famous home run call, Wheels? What would you say? It was Mike Schmidt's 500th home run, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and absolutely. He, yeah. He, did, he did not say out of here. He, if you listen to that right. call, he did not say out of here because he just said what popped into his head. Yeah. You know, he didn't have to force feed some kind of signature call in there. He just said what popped into his mind, which, which I, you know, I always had a lot of respect for. And Andy Muster, I think, might be the most underrated broadcaster, especially sportscaster, Philadelphia's ever seen. People didn't give him the appreciation he deserved because he wasn't Harry. But that guy was damn good, and I know you agree with that. Yeah, uh, as I said, um, uh, you know, I, I, I knew Andy since... I guess it was around 1966, around 67, when I, I got a job as a kid in the newsroom at WCAU Radio while I was still going to Penn State. I go back and forth. I play soccer because I was a decent baseball player. And Jack Downey at the time wanted some younger guys, so I got a job there. And Andy and I became great friends. He used to take me up to Connie Mack Stadium. I would, I would ride in a car with him, the legend named Jimmy Dykes, who, you know, around Philadelphia, you know, Jimmy Dykes, would sit in the car and he talks to tell stories about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and, and I'm, I'd be sitting in the back seat like, oh my God, am I really listening to this right now? <laughs> wow. So yeah, Andy and I were very, very close and and I was going to use the term that you use, Jason, underrated. I, I And I think he was overshadowed by Harry and yeah. everybody would have overshadowed by Harry Callis because Harry Callis was just last by himself but Andy was a terrific announcer for the Philadelphia Eagles for the Philadelphia 76ers yeah. and then for the Phillies and uh he had good careers in New York and San Diego uh before coming back coming back and and settling back in our area he was from Harrisburg he was from, from Lemoyne Pennsylvania in the Harrisburg area so it was uh it was comfortable for him to be here and he never let that bother him. Andy never let it bother him that he wasn't the the top guy that he wasn't the top in the broadcasting team he knew his role he he worked hard at it he did what he could he did it the best he could and uh look as i said earlier when you do what we do and do what you do some people like you some people don't like you and yeah. you just have to learn to somehow not let it bother you well you know and, and you could tell andy was very secure with his ability very secure in his position and and yeah you know we talked earlier about versatility and and you just said it i mean he did baseball, he did football, he did basketball, both pro and college. Uh, he even did, like, didn't he do a couple of Super Bowls on the radio for CBS Radio, I think? I mean, so we're, we're talking we're talking about a big-time announcer here. Yeah, he may have. I'm not sure about that. But, uh, yeah, he definitely was so versatile to do all the things that he did in Philadelphia. He did talk shows on WCAU when they first started doing talk shows uh, before there was sports radio, WCAU radio was a, that's when I was working. There it was a two way, it was a, a talk station, you yeah. know, where they would have callers. And that was one of the first stations to ever do that. I think in our area, it was the first one to do that. So he was very good at that sort of look, Andy, the best thing that I could ever say about Andy Muster was he was a pro. Yep. And when you're in our business and you work with a pro and you're around them, you know who they are. And he was a he was a he was one of them and one of the all time good guys too. Good people, uh, good um, good person. Everything about him was just uh, he was a great friend, and I miss him to this day. And I'll tell you what, his call of that Schmidt home run in Montreal, you know, he buried it. He buried, <laughs> he buried it. it. That that is not just, in my opinion, anyway. That's not just one of the all time great Phillies calls. That's one of the all time great baseball calls that I've ever heard um I mean that that call that call, I mean it look it's lived on for how long it, it will live on forever that call yeah I was sitting right beside him when he did it and I was so proud of him and he you know I you probably never heard this before but I'll tell you he worried a little bit about that call later because as you just said he really? buried it well that's a basketball term and you know he always felt that some people thought of him more basketball announcer than a baseball announcer so he it bothered him a little bit and i said forget it you know he did a great job with it and people aren't going to knit in and, and i said the people that are nitpicking at you for that forget about them they have no lives but it did bother him because that is a basketball term when you think about it you know what i i i never made that connection but yeah but but listen i mean 
That that's a great call. I don't care if it was a basketball term. That was that was a damn good call. <laughs> that was a great call. I, I want to ask you about a, another moment that I'm sure you remember that all Phillies fans remember. So, 2008 World Series <laughs> final the the final strike. Uh, Brad Lidd strikes out. Was it was Eric Hinsky? I think it was right. Eric, Eric Hinsky, Hinsky for Tampa. Yeah. And yep. Harry Callis is making the call. And they got a camera in the booth, and they're they're showing you guys, and you're in the background doing, you know, and and, <laughs> but but what 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 I guess what I admired most about that was, you were trying so hard to stifle yourself to let Harry have that moment, which is very admirable, very respectable, and then you came in after a little while and said, hey, how about this team? I mean, how hard was that for you to keep quiet? <laughs> You know, when Andy made that great call, mm-hmm. I whooped a little bit in the background. And to that, I, I regretted that. I regretted really? that. But I was so excited. I made a little, you'll hear it. There's a little bit of noise in there. I didn't make a big, but there, there were more than should have been in there. Uh, and I got in the, in the way. Anyway, when when that was happening in the ninth inning in that game, and they had the runner, and Tampa Bay had the runner at second base with one out, and, and Lidge is on the mound, and God knows I wasn't going to say that at that point. You talk about the ultimate black catter. <laughs> but I remember the one thing I said to myself was, look, Harry didn't get a chance to call the, uh, the World Series in 1980. We weren't on the air. That changed after that. So we had to make a record of it and did a great job. But um, I said, whatever you do, shut up. Don't say anything. Don't make a sound. Let this man have his moment. He deserves it. He didn't have the moment in 1980 when it was the last shot at doing something like this, the last out of a World Series that you're winning it at home with that crowd in the background and all. And then when I saw that thing later on at the party about two hours later, me jumping around, you know, I thought, oh, my God, you look like an idiot. No, you know? no, no, not at all. No. You know, Jason, the thing that the greatest thing about that happened, I mean, a lot has happened since but the next day when we're going down Broad Street and you, you were there and you remember what that was like and uh, the floats were, you know, it took forever to get down there because there were so many people and it would stop. When I would look out over our float at this sea of faces, I would have these young people coming up to the float and go start going like this to me. <laughs> and I said, OK, it's all right. What you did was all right. Yeah, no, it was, it was more than all right. And um, I, I remember and gosh, I forget the year. It was it was the uh, the March of Dimes Philadelphia Air Awards, and you were given was it was it a lifetime achievement award? I, I remember you got an award. You were you were presented something. I, I was I was in the room, but I was too nervous to walk up to you guys and say hello back then. Um, but <laughs> but as as they introduced you, I guess it was Scott Fransky, maybe L.A. They got up and they did that thing. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. <laughs> but they, you know what? They en- good. They en- really enjoyed it and. In fact, when I when I was lucky enough to write that book a few years ago that I that I did okay with, uh, uh, on the back on the dust cover on the back, um, they they staged a picture of all of us when we were taking our broadcast picture, uh, of of doing that thing with everybody doing the, and it, it was a great you know Sarge is in it and it was just a great picture and something I cherish to this day. And, but you know what? I want to get back to what you were saying about how you know you didn't want to you, you wanted to make sure you shut up and let and let Harry you know have the moment. I mean, I remember, uh, and it's funny that record that you mentioned because um, you said you said Harry, you guys couldn't do the series in 1980, so they made a record. I have that record, the Fantastic Phillies. It was sold at Kitty City, I think it was. <laughs> anyway, but I, I have I have I have that vinyl, and I've listened to that a million times. And there are so many calls yeah. where I hear. Richie Ashburn in the background going, oh, and to me, and like and today, you hear L.A. in the background when, uh, like when Scott Fransky made the call of the Bryce Harper home run against San Diego, you know, you hear L.A., yes, and to me, that just adds to the call, you know? I mean, I, I don't look at it like the well, color analyst is interrupting. You, if someone was in there. Well... As, as you know, as, as somebody was in there for so many years and 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 did that, it's hard to be quiet. It yeah. really is because you're involved. You sure. know, this is your team. You're emotionally involved. You're with these guys from February, you know, and it, and you're part of their lives and everything. They're your friends, a lot of them. So it's hard not to get involved, and it's hard not to make noise in the background. And I used to have whether it was a bad habit or not. 
<laughs> and people told me that knew the game pretty well. I was pretty good at reading a ball off the bat. And when the guy would hit something, I'd go, oh, well, they knew right away it was a home. <laughs> you know, when I wasn't on the air, when I was doing color, they guess as soon as they heard me go, oh, they knew it was out. Because I knew it was out as soon as it was hit. So I tried to refrain from doing that, but it was hard. So, you know, uh, if, if guys are going to, you know, I know Larry does that with Scott and all. Hey, hey look, Larry's very, he's a play, he's an ex-player. He's very emotional. He gets involved in the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, to each his own. I just, that night, um, I just, I just had a little talk with myself when I was sitting there. I said, just don't get in the way of Harry Callis right here. And as it turned out, Jason, I was so happy that that happened because we lost him the next year. So yeah. we never had a chance to do that. Oh yeah, I mean, because uh, it was it was uh, it was early in the season in 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 oh nine, right? It was 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 it? Yeah, it was this month. Was it wasn't it May? Was it or was it April? It was in April. We had we had uh, gone out to Denver and played the Rockies three games and gotten in late to Washington, who was playing a day game. It was their home opener, and he wasn't feeling well, from what I was told. I didn't he didn't tell me this, but people told me he wasn't feeling well, and he said, "Well, I'll go see the doctor when I get home." You know, and he right. Went down in the booth. Uh, I was down. I would have been there so many times right beside him when it happened. You know, I'm so happy it wasn't. <laughs> right. Because I couldn't have done anything. Everybody said that he had, he had you know, he was in trouble. Um, but I was down doing the pregame with Charlie. And Charlie just loved it. You know, I had a great relationship with Charlie. So we used to sit and talk all the time before sure. I do the show, after I do the show. So I was down yeah. in his office and walking out of the clubhouse when Frank Kopenbarger, our our equipment, our traveling secretary, equipment manager said, Hey, there's a problem up in the booth. Harry Callis is down in the booth right now. And, oh, and I went down to the batting cage where they were taking indoor hitting. Uh, and I went down and told Charlie, I said, Chuck, we got a problem right now. And that, that started the day Montgomery finally took charge of and did with his uh, amazing, amazing grace that that man had. Uh, talk about somebody we all miss. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I remember most about uh, about that day, I I had to announce Harry's passing on the radio. I was I was doing middays at ninety five seven Ben FM at the time. I was on ten to three, and I remember around eleven thirty, our traffic manager comes into the studio and says, "There's a report on the news that Harry Callis collapsed in the booth." And you know, I grew up idolizing Harry Callis, so I'm like. What's going on? So, like, maybe 45 minutes later, he goes, he walks in the studio and goes like this to me. And that's how he told me that Harry died. So I had to announce it on the air. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, I, I almost broke down making the announcement. Um, it's funny, you know, and I don't know if, if, you, if you realize this, Wheels, you know, when doing what you do, whether it's Harry, you, you know, these days, Tom McCarthy, Scott Fransky, L.A., Kruk, you know, all those guys... Even though someone may not know you, you're a friend. You know, you it's it's like we develop a relationship with with our announcer because baseball, especially on the radio, is such, such an intimate game and an intimate experience. And even though I mean, and I had met Harry a couple times, but I certainly didn't know him. I certainly wasn't friends with him. But yet, I felt like I lost somebody close to me. And that's the effect you guys have on Phillies fans. Uh, you know, I had a couple of hard days in the booth. Uh, when we lost Whitey, uh, he, he passed away yep. at like five o'clock in the morning in his hotel room in New York. So we had all day. We had all day to prepare ourselves to do that opening and, you know, what we're going to say. And boy, when, you know, we didn't have much time. And, yeah. and we knew we were going to, and, and they weren't going to take that opening. We were going to do that live. And Tom yeah. jumped right in there and, of course, did an amazing job that he's done ever since. Uh, and Sarge and I were on. And, I can never forget, Jason, looking at that camera that day. And you know what it's like when you, you know, it's just you and that camera. And I said, man, just don't mess this up. You know, just say from your heart what you're thinking. And, th and that was the hardest, hardest thing I've ever done in that. Because I knew there were millions of people out in the Delaware Valley who had not heard from anybody. Uh, and this was going to be their first first experience with anybody who had just been through this whole thing. Right. And I wanted to convey the emotions the best I could. And everybody said we did a really good job that day, but I'll tell you what, the rest of the game was a blur to me because I was drained after that opening. Well, yeah, I, 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 and I said this to, to both Scott and to LA and I'll say it to you now. I don't know how you guys did it. I, I, I mean, that, that had to be so difficult 
to actually focus and do a game? How, how did, I mean, I know you say it's a blur, but do you remember, how did you do it? How'd you get through it? Well, I think David's, I mean, I mentioned David earlier. Yeah. And on that, that man is so, was so important. And another guy I missed so much because you could always talk to him and he may not tell you what you wanted to hear, but hmm. boy, you could take what he told you to the bank. Cause he was the most honest, decent person you ever wanted to be around. He handled that situation so well that day. Look, it was a nationals home opener. Uh, they were, you know, they had just come down from Montreal recently. They weren't drawing much. They were a bad team. Uh, and, and, and they, he talked it over with the uh, front office of the Expos of, of the uh, Nationals before the game. And say, like, we're going to do this. Harry would want to do this. Yeah. Would we have done it if it happened at home? That's a different, that's a different story. I don't know that. Yeah. But you know, they, we went on with that game that day <clears throat> and I felt the way David handled that, and he said we lost our voice, and became a you know one a great quote from him, uh, and the class that he handled that, and and uh, I just said to myself, look, just be like David today, and just make everybody proud of you the best you could do. So, and you know, once it started, it was a baseball game, yeah. uh, and and that's what I did, and I loved the game so much, and the Phillies had a really good offensive day. I remember Shane Victorino hitting a home run and pointing up you to pointed us to the, the booth, yeah. Box. I remember that. Uh, so it, it, it was hard, but I think if it had, if if it had been a lousy game or a bad game or I don't know, but we had a job to do that day. And uh, to me, you're right. I'm, I'm not saying what I, I I went back to the hotel room that night. I was absolutely drained, and I was writing my book at the time, and I knew that it uh, wasn't going to go to press the way that they wanted it to, uh, because I had to rewrite the chapter on Harry Callis and what had just happened today. And we luckily got rained out the next day. We were supposed to go to the White House. Oh, that's right. That's the following month when we came down. And I spent a lot of that night, you know, answering texts and emails and everything. And then the next day, rewriting that chapter to that book because yeah. uh, it was just so traumatic. But we had a job to do, and I think we did it. And I, I really appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I I so admire Tom McCarthy. Um <laughs> Really? It, because you know, first of all, um, I know when when they brought when they brought Tom McCarthy back from the Mets, he was obviously brought in to be the heir apparent. But you know, obviously, we all thought that there was still there was still more time with Harry. It's just whenever Harry decided to retire, Tom would move in. Um, obviously, nobody expected Harry to to go away. Um, but Tom steps in. Um, that could not have been easy. First of all, it's never easy to follow a legend, but it's certainly not easy to follow a legend who dies suddenly. Um, how amazing is Tom McCarthy? I mean, he and, and he's, he's still doing it to this day, and he's fantastic. Well, you know, I mean, Tom Tom takes his heat like everybody takes it. But if you don't realize that this guy's the ultimate professional and that we're sure. lucky to have him, then that's your problem. I agree. That's the way I look at it. I'm prejudiced. He's one of the world's nicest people, too. And genuinely, as you know, you've been around him. Yep. He, he's warm, he's giving, he's caring, and he's a very, very good announcer. I have people, boy, he's really good on football. On that idea that he would be doing stuff on a national basis, I think, well, I'm not saying that I knew he was going to be doing it on a national basis or that he knew it, Yeah. but I'm not surprised. Yeah, neither am I. He's, he's fantastic. Very what, he's very prepared. He's very good at what he does. And one of the best things he does is use his analyst. He's he's not a booth hog. He's a guy who understands that there's two people in on at the same time, or three people, which is always one too many, uh, at the same time. <laughs> uh, and the the best thing you can do to make yourself look good and better is to have a rapport with that guy that's next to you. Yeah. And he very very tuned into that, and he can he does it seamlessly. I'm a look. I'm a big fan of Tom McCarthy's as a person, number one, because I've been lucky enough to know him for so long. But uh, as a broadcaster, he's very very good. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic, and I agree. He he's great. I love when I catch him doing a football game or doing a basketball game. Uh, you know, I remember back in the day. I sometimes I would stumble across uh, you know a, a, a Westwood One broadcast of Harry Cal is doing football, and it's like, wait a second. I know that voice. Harry Cow's doing yeah. football. Wow. And he worked with Jack Cam, too, a lot. <clears throat> on that. That's right. And uh, I got to meet Jack. We don't have to get into all that. But <laughs> I got to meet Jack Cam a couple of times. And 
you know, he realized that I was a guy that worked with Harry and we would talk about that. When Harry went to do Notre Dame football, I said to him, I looked him right in the eye. I said, all right, go do the games, but don't become one of them. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> so we used to kid about that all the time. I said, Harry, you went to Iowa. He didn't go to Notre Dame. Ah, but I feel like a golden domer, pal. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, before, before I wrap this up, you mentioned the book a few times, and I want to show the book. And I want to tell everybody. Uh, so, I, Chris, uh, Wills, I assume this is, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, like wherever you can get your books, right? Yeah, and I didn't mean that to bring that up for you to show that. You know me. I, it just well, no, there was there was a reason I wanted to bring it up, but yeah. So Thank you. wherever you, wherever you get books, right? Any any pretty much anywhere. Yeah, you know, people still can buy. I've had people down here in Bel Air, Florida, after they got the you know I've gotten to know them a little bit. They went on Amazon, bought the book, and had me sign it. You know, over, over the golf course out the out the door here. So. Yeah, evidently it's still available. I did. It had a couple printings. I did a um, an extra chapter or two in another edition <clears> at the end, and it did it did, it did okay. Very very proud of it. People told me, you know, the biggest compliment I got, Jason, when someone would tell me it made them laugh and made them cry, and I thought, well, what else could I have done? Yeah, and and that it sounded like you. And I said, well, I, I wrote it. I mean, I had a great co-writer and, and uh, you know, I, I did. There's no, no doubt about that, how it was tremendous. But, uh, you know, I wrote most of it myself and then he would edit it. Uh, so that's why it sounded like me. Uh, and then I got, well, boy, we love that. When are you going to write another one? I said, you got the only one you're ever going to get. I said, that was too much work and I'm never writing another one. And I'm never going to write a book with any dirt in it. So don't wait for that. <laughs> now, my my question is: Would you sign a <clears throat> excuse me? Would you sign a copy for me? That's what I of want to know. Course. Of course, I'll be back in July <clears throat> in Philadelphia, and I'll be down to ballpark sometime. So we'll figure it out. I'd be more than be my honor. I'd be more than happy. To. I I would love that. And I I know uh, Tim McCarver did the forward to the book, and I know that was very important to you. You had a very close relationship yeah. with Tim McCarver. Uh, just uh, just talk about that because I I think. You know, in a lot of ways, and we all know what kind of broadcasting career Tim McCarver had. He's in the Hall of Fame. He thanked you. He mentioned you in his Hall of Fame speech. That's the impact you had on him. Just, just talk about that and his early days in broadcasting and how you kind of helped him along. You know, in that Hall of Fame speech, I'll never forget it because I was lucky enough. I was there with Renee, and Joe Torrey was sitting right behind me with his son. And when Timmy mentioned me, he slapped me on the back. He said, you deserve that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Joe, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, Timmy and I, Timmy and I hit it off when he was a player. Uh, we we were we we talked the first that first time he was there. He wasn't there that long. He was gone, you know, and then he came back, and and we became pretty close. And uh, the first year that he was going to become a broadcaster, we went up to Channel Seventeen Studios, and they put a monitor down and put a tape on with no sound. And uh, and he said, "Well, what are we doing?" I said, "Well." We'll just work at this. And so a play would run, you know, and, and I would describe the play and I'd say, and I'd look at him and look back at me, like, you know, those eyes are his, and he looked back at me and he'd, and he'd go, wheels, what do you want me to say? <laughs> and I'd say, Tim, the idea is for you to just say something right, right. now. And Jason, I mean, he, he, he just had it. Uh, he, he was so good. He was yeah. so aware, you know, he, Timmy was smart. He had a great vocabulary. He's a catcher, you know, so he was back there. He, he had all that Gibson stuff and Carlton stuff that he did. He, you know, people want to make him out to be a buffoon sometimes. He was just special. Uh, and, and I told him, I said, you know, you're the John Madden of, of baseball. You, you revolutionized the analyst role in baseball. And he always made a point to tell everybody that I was his first partner. That I was the guy that took him and taught him how to do his job. That's that's awesome. That was, and you know, I miss him so much. I really do. It's really cool when somebody who has that kind of success doesn't forget how they started, <laughs> doesn't forget where they came from. That that's that's very very cool. I love hearing that. We we spent a lot of time. We were both Civil War uh, history buffs and World War II history. Buffs. So we spent a lot of time. I told I tell people we talked on the phone a lot about baseball. Don't get me wrong. Uh, after his career, after my career ended, and he was still on the air, and after he was he was finishing all that, but we spent a lot of time talking about the books we read. I mean, that's what he was very very into reading and learning and sharing it with people. And he's just a 
And, you know, some people, I don't like to be talked too much. Well, sh- he didn't talk too much. And shut up and learn something from him, you know, because you could have, <laughs> you'd have just be quiet and listen. But anyway, I learned to deal with all that. <laughs> so, but the guy, the guy was real. Uh, and when he was your friend, you couldn't have had a better friend. And I, I can't remember uh, a guy in my life that uh, I was closer with. Well, you know what? And and, and I, I never met Tim McCarver, but, uh, you know, I, all I know is, as a baseball fan, I know. Well, number one, I, I know I always enjoyed watching a game he was on. He always taught me something, even though I mean I've been a baseball fan my, my whole life. But I, it seems like he and you did the same thing. You could always learn something by listening to the guy on the radio or, or on TV. And anytime the national baseball contract changed hands, anytime a new network took over, <laughs> the first thing they did was hire Tim McCarver. And what does that tell you? Great point. Uh, and I used to try to explain that to people too. They say, oh, I don't like he talks too much. He does this stuff. Yeah. Well, the networks think he's pretty special. So, uh, you know, he's, he's making a lot of money while you're complaining about everything. So just, just enjoy him. Uh, look, he had a, he had a joy for life, um, food, wine, yeah. travel. Uh, he was a, he was a, he was an every man, uh, every man's man. And, uh, and then he could be a dirt ball. Uh, because of what he did for a, for a living, you know, he could he could get right down into that. He he was a what do they say the man? Uh, and uh, I say it again, he was just special. I spent time with him last year when we were losing him. He was down in Sarasota, and I could tell it wasn't going to have a happy ending. But we were able to. You no, know, he wasn't able to talk a whole lot or listen. But he knew me. Yeah. And one time he looked at me, he raised his head, and he says, "Wheels." Uh, we were in his, he was in his hospital bed and he raised his head and he went wheels. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and it just killed me. It just killed me. I said, well, Timmy, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to do that for you, but we can't get out of here. Right. right. Now. Oh man. What do you remember? Um, in 1980. So, um, and, and help me out with this. So he wanted to come back and play in 1980 so we can play in parts of four different decades because not a lot of people can can say that. So he technically paid, played from 59 to 80. So how did that all come about? Because and and when did he come back? Was it just toward the end of the season? What? How did that all work out? Well, as you know, he was a broadcaster during the 80 season. Right. Then they act they activate him back in those days. You know, you could you. You know, you could activate X number of players. You still can. It got ridiculous, and now it's better now. So they they activated Timmy. In fact, he did a few post game shows for us on the old Prism Television, and I think Channel Seventeen in those days in his uniform. In, in uniform, that's he, right. Yeah. He even interviewed Lefty one time. Left Lefty Lefty wouldn't talk to him either on the air. <laughs> and he, and Lefty loved Timmy like nobody else, but he said nope, and he finally did it. So that was his thing that he was going to come back um, and and play uh, and be in uniform. Now, when we clinched in Montreal in that great game you're talking about that Andy uh, had the call on, on Michael's home run, um, so nobody wanted to play the next day. You, you get the regulars out. Timmy played that day, mm-hmm. and I'll never forget it. He hit a double into the right field corner wow. of Storm and the hitter named Steve Ratzer. And when he got to second base, he didn't point at the dugout. He pointed up at us in the booth. Nice. High up in the air in, in the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And we stood up and gave him a standing ovation. So he got his final hit there in Montreal on the last day of the season. And he was a, a four-decade player because he was activated in the month of September that year. But he basically was a broadcaster that year and did the playoffs. Uh, he, you, you hear him You hear him on that uh, in that great game in Houston. And he was on the air with Harry. I was on with Andy on radio when that when that crazy ninth inning, tenth inning happened in Game Five. And you'll hear Timmy kind of laughing in the background when mm-hmm. Manny Trio hits that triple down the left. Oh, line. right, right. He is wonderful. I, mean, I just can't say enough things about him. Yeah, yeah, one of the all-time greats. All right, I, I want to end with this because you mentioned Prism. All right, and yeah. the. The game in 93 that ended at 4.41 in the morning, the doubleheader, <laughs> everybody hears the radio call of Harry, you know, Mitchie Poo, you know, base hit. Yeah. <laughs> but you you were on Prism, right, doing the play-by-play? And and was it was it Jay Johnstone or Gary Maddox? Who were you working with then? Jay Johnstone. Jay Johnstone, tr- okay. He was a trooper that night, Jason. He, yeah, uh, 
I'll never forget about one twenty in the morning, the first game, and you know, a, a wrap up and everything. And I hear Larry Shane come on the PA and, and say that the second game will begin at one twenty. And, <laughs> and I remember JJ and I looking at each other like, "What?" <laughs> so yeah, and that you know, I think they were both extra inning games that night. They so, were, yeah. Um, he. <laughs> Lost him recently too. I give Jay a lot of credit. He worked hard, so hard that night, and we were soaking wet. It was so hot, and those lights were hot in the booth. But you know, I was never, I was never one to ever complain about anything because I thought I had the, you know, the dream job, and every, and so many people would like to have it. But Jay did a great job. And look, Harry's call. I don't know what, I don't know what I said or what I sounded <laughs> like, or I don't even care because his, and he used to call Mitch Mitchy Poo all yeah. the times. So. I think that's the first time the the fans heard Mitchie Poo. We'd heard Mitchie Poo plenty of times before that. <laughs> so uh, as that night went on, and as it got later and later, I mean, how hard is that? I mean, you're fighting fatigue. I'm sure you're fighting hunger. Did they get pizza for you guys? I mean, I, <laughs> what happened as as the night and as the morning went on? Yeah, I think we had food. We had they. Stuff got delivered to the press box. I know they had it in the radio booth because Whitey would have been begging for it all night. So <laughs> I'm sure they had a four course meal going on in there. Um, I don't know. You, you, you know, I, it's like I say, Jason. I never thought about. I just I loved what I did. I was I was there for the moment, and I, and I I just tried to do the best I could, like I did every night. And was I fatigued? Yeah. Sure, because like I said, it was so hot and we had to be back the next night to do a night game. And then four or five days later, we played a 20 inning game with the Dodgers on Kevin Stocker's first game in the major leagues. Oh, wow. And it was a heat that. wave in Philadelphia. That's why we had all those storms, all that rain and all that. But, it, you know, it was a joy. I, I, I can't remember ever not wanting to be there. I, I For 37 years, I made every road trip and I got tired of it a little at the end and all. But I always felt that... You know, I grew up in, I was born in Yadin. I grew up in Delaware County in Newtown Square. I said, I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I'm doing fit games for my hometown team. So just enjoy every minute of it because it could end tomorrow. And it finally ended, you know, after the 2013 season. But I had a pretty good run. Uh, you, you had a great run and, and you are missed on the air. I, I could tell you that. Uh, before I let you go real quick, uh, and again, apologies to people listening to this and not watching this, but I see a picture on your wall in the background of one of the one of the all time, I guess the, one of the most famous plays ever in Philly's history, the foul ball that Bob Boone bobbled that Pete Rose caught. Um, yeah. What do you remember about that moment? I know you guys weren't on the air because, as we talked about, there was no local World Series broadcast back then. But I'm, I know you you were probably there. What do you remember about that? Well, I was down in the clubhouse um because i was my job my job was to get the start the world series mvp to the oh it's something i'll never live down i got to tell this story because schmitty never lets me forget it <laughs> okay um, if you watch the video of that night uh with Bowie kuhn and ruley and everybody up there and i think i forget who was doing it for nbc the interviews so i think, think it was anyway, brian gumble wasn't it no it wasn't brian gumble no was, okay uh, i think of it about Dan, I'll, I'll 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 email you Okay. I text you. Uh, but anyway, my job, Larry Schenk said, look, Schmitty's going to be the MVP if we win this thing. Uh, your job is again. Now, you remember back in those days, the print media, 1880. And there were hundreds of print media there. It's not sure. like it is now where social media and television have taken over. Yeah. So I Here comes Michael up the, the gang, uh, up, the, up the runway. And he gives me a big hug. And I says, Mike, come on, we got to get it. Make a long story short. I did my job. Mike Schmidt never appears on national television that night because I got him down to be with the media. And he has never let me forget that. My grandmother only lived a few oh, years after oh, that. No. She didn't get the, he kids, he kids about it. But <laughs> I, he kids me about it. But yeah, that was my job. So I was down in the clubhouse watching it on a little black and white TV in the back in the laundry room with a great old clubhouse guy we named, uh, we had named Pete Sierra. And he and I were watching it together. Uh, and I remember when Booney made that play, um, I'm thinking, I think we're going to win the World Series because Willie Wilson was coming up next. And, you know, he was just swinging and missing at everything. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Tug got him. Tug later, I mean, I had a conversation with Tug the next day. We were talking about 
you know, the party that night and he, he and I were good friends and he called and we were just talking. He told me his arm was falling off. He says, he said, I couldn't feel my fingers. He said, I don't know what I'd have done if Booney hadn't caught that thing or if uh, Pete hadn't come over and caught that thing. Now, wow. Booney's story, of course, to this day, I, uh, he, I he is very, very agitated when we give Pete too much credit. He said, you see how far, you know, and you got to look at he's, that again. He's he right. He, he ran down well. the first, ba- first base line. He was all the way down the camera yep. well. And he says, he's going, where the hell's Pete? <laughs> I believe. Pete way off the line because it was uh, Wathen, I think. I mean, it was Frank White who hit it. And Wathen, and he was off the line. Um, and he comes running over there and makes that play. And Booney says, I'm so tired of everybody telling him what a great play he made. He said, he should have been there before me. And, he, you know, we've had, always had that. I, and Pete laughs. I, I, I think the one quote I heard Bob Boone say about that was, and, and almost I'm quoting word for word for word. Charlie hustle my ass is I think right. what he, is what he said. Right. <laughs> Another picture that I have behind me, that, you know, you really, you really can't, you really can't see it. But uh, the picture I have behind me is a couple years ago, we had something at Ruth Eckerd Hall down here in Clearwater where Booney, Bull, uh, Boa and uh, Pete were on the dais. We're up there on a stage mm-hmm. and I was the MC, and that came up with the two of them sitting there uh-huh. together. And they had a little byplay on it. It was fun. <laughs> I love it. Wheels, listen, man, I, I could talk to you all night. I've kept you long enough. This uh, this time really flew by, man. I always love talking to you. Um, I, I, I appreciate this so much. Thanks for doing this. And I'm hoping we could talk again maybe, uh, you know, later on in the summer when uh, the Phillies are still, you know, <laughs> 21 games over 500 or whatever and, and, <laughs> and, and looking toward the playoffs. Wheels, thank well, you, man. My game plan right now is I'm back in Philadelphia. I'll be back about mid-July, Jason. So, uh, you know, absolutely, we can do this anytime. And uh, I always, I've always, you know, I've known you for a long time. I always enjoy talking to you because you love the game. You understand what we go through because you've been in front of a camera and behind a microphone. And, you know, it's not brain surgery, but you're working without a net. And yeah. it's live. Hey. Uh, and uh, it, it, you appreciate it, so I, I appreciate that. Yeah, listen, uh, th- there's live TV is uh, <laughs> live TV can be tough. Live radio can be tough, but I think you agree, Wheels. There's a certain adrenaline rush to when you're on the air live, and as you said, there's no safety net. The adrenaline does start pumping, does it not? Absolutely, uh, and I can't remember a night, even though we were taping the openings a lot of times on television, I can't remember a night that I didn't get sweaty palms right before I did it. And uh, you, you know, when to kick the adrenaline in and make sure you you didn't sound like you had, a, you know, you were uh, even if the team was going bad and the lights were hot and right. you had to do take three because the camera didn't, you know, they didn't get it or something. <laughs> you know, you just as I said before, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse with this. I felt so fortunate to do that for so long in my hometown. And I never took it for granted, not for one day. Yeah. Well, like, like I said, um, you know, you're, you're, you're missed on the air. Uh, you still, you still have a lot of fans all across the Delaware Valley. And, um, I'm hoping a lot of people, uh, will, will listen to this and watch this and, uh, enjoy the conversation that we had. Cause I certainly did wheels. Thank you. Anytime, Jason, keep in touch. Uh, you got it. And thank you for tuning in to episode 15 of the Philly Sports Convo. We'll talk to you next time.